welcome back to my study. Um, there is a conference call going on at my house, so I'm hoping that there's not too much of a delay on the sound for you. I'm hoping also that you can hear me okay. Um, yesterday I changed position and the recording was a little quieter. So I'm hoping that today we are back to normal with the sound. Um, there's no glare because it's so dull and rainy here today. Well, we are here studying our next chapter of the book of Daniel. And if you're with us yesterday, you'll remember that uh, Daniel and his friends were in a very difficult position. They had been carried off as exiles into the land of Babylon. And they'd had all of their identity as God's people stripped away. Even their names had been changed so that they could be assimilated into this different culture. And it was a very brutal regime. And we thought yesterday about the relevance of this book to us, because as we learn on Sunday from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17, we are living as foreigners here in our land, here in the UK, because our home is in heaven. And that can sometimes bring difficulty and conflict. And so there is much wisdom to be had about our situation as we study the book of Daniel. And so we're moving into chapter two of Daniel today. And we're going to split this into four different sections. In verses one to 13, we've got a troubled king and a job for God. Verses 14 to 30, a wise captive and a God who makes things known. Verses 31 to 45, the empires that pass and the kingdom that remains. And then verses 46 to 49, the earthly king praises the true king. So those are our sections. I hope you've got your Bibles open in front of you as we whiz through them. So verses 1 to 13, a troubled king and a job for God. Look at verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So here's Nebuchadnezzar. He is the most powerful man in the world at that time. He's got armies. He's got riches. Whatever he says goes. But one thing he hasn't got is peace. He's troubled. We're told that twice, aren't we? And Dale Davis, whose commentary I'm using alongside this, says this. He's the king of Babylon and he's shaking. Sorry. Knowledge is failing me today. My book just fell off. Not quite sure why that is. Sorry, be with you now. Sorry, I hope you're not getting seasick with the movement. I don't know why it's not standing up properly today. Bear with me. Apologies. Technical hitch this morning. Let's see if I can fix it now. Right, there we are. Hopefully that's not going to fall over again. I don't know what's happening today. Right, OK. So this is what Dale Davis says. He's the king of Babylon and he's shaking as he unbuttons his PJs in the morning. He might be the king of Babylon, but he is troubled. And that's often the case with leaders in the world who've got massive amounts of power. They've also got insecurity. And that is a very nasty mix, isn't it? Power plus insecurity often leads to tremendous brutality. And that's what we see with Nebuchadnezzar. 
So what is it that's made him troubled? Well, we see that it's a dream. He's had a dream. And so he decides to set a task for his astrologers. And it is an impossible task. Verse 5, he tells them that uh, they firmly, he's firmly decided, if you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Well, what a job they've got to do. They've not only got to interpret the dream, they probably would have managed that quite well. I expect they had a how to interpret dreams book, but they haven't just got to interpret it. They've got to tell him what his dream was. Now, it's not because he's forgotten his dream. Remember, this is a dream that's causing him to be troubled. And if you've had a bad dream, then it's not something you easily forget. So he's not forgotten his dream. He's testing them. He's brutal and he's cruel. He sets an impossible task and then will penalise them when they can't do it. I wonder if you've ever had a boss that was a little bit like that, setting you impossible tasks and then blaming you when you couldn't do them as he expected or she expected. Well, hopefully your earthly uh, boss in the 21st century wasn't as cruel as this boss back in uh, the five five oh five six, whenever uh, five oh seven actually uh, no five oh one this would be wouldn't it we go we go back in time don't we anyway whatever um it's an impossible job and they they're desperate aren't they they don't know what they're gonna do because they know that they can't tell the king his dream yet they unwittingly stumble over the solution and a truth. Look at verse 11. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods and they do not live among humans. So they've got the answer. They know that they need a supernatural response to this problem. Yet they look to their own religion, to their pagan religion of Babylon, and in that they can find no solution. Their gods are silent. But we know that there is a God who is not silent. A God who can answer the question. And it really does throw into relief two kind of world views. You've got sort of paganism and you've got the worship of the living God. And we still have these two different things today. And Dale Davis, in his commentary, he points out something um, from current American culture. He says, Peter Moore describes the impressive sunken garden in front of the rare book library on Yale University's campus. It is meant to simulate the universe. A large marble pyramid stands in one corner, symbolising time. Another corner sports a huge donut shaped structure standing on its side. It signifies energy. In a third corner is a huge die perched on one tip as if ready to topple in any which way. It is the symbol of chance. This, Moore says, is the worldview of modern man a self existing universe consisting of energy, time, and chance. And those in Babylon, ancient or modern, don't know which way the die will fall. Chance is opaque. It is the world of whatever. Bible Christians think the Yale Garden is a lie. They hold that there is a God who knows and orders the course of history down through the rise and rubble of nations until the days when he sets up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. There is no brilliant, this is no brilliant insight of theirs. They only hold this because there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and has done so. He has given them revelation material like Daniel 2. So that's the God we have. A God who can reveal mysteries and we will see that in our next section. So let's look down to verses 14 to 30. 
We've got a wise captive and a God who makes things known. So our kind of the camera shifts, doesn't it, to Daniel. And we saw in chapter one that Daniel is somebody who is wise. He has a God given wisdom. And we see it here in absolute spades. Because what does he do? Because he's one of these advisors, of course. He's going to be killed if this dream can't be interpreted, along with all of those other ones. So he has a plan. First thing he does is he goes to speak to the executioner and to the king. And we saw yesterday that when he speaks, he has such wisdom and calm. He doesn't go in ranting and raging. He doesn't flow off the handle. He uses wisdom and tact, we're told, in verse 14. And then after he's gone and spoken to, to the executioner and to the king, he goes and speaks to his believing friends. That's verse 17. So he goes to speak to his friends to talk it over with them, to involve them in the situation, to seek their help through prayer. And that's what he does, verse 18. He asks them for prayer and no doubt he prays himself too. That's what we know about Daniel. It's one of the things the children learn about Daniel. He was a man of prayer. And how important it is to go to God in prayer when we are in a fix and when we're not in a fix, of course, but most importantly, when we are. And there's a great pattern there, isn't there, of, of a wise way of dealing with things, tackling the situation head on with wisdom and tact, not letting it fester. Of course, he didn't have time to let it fester. But we think about our problems. He talks things over with believing friends. Do you do that? Which friends do you choose to talk things over with? Because we can have a wise friend who's not a Christian and that's great. But they're going to always lack a certain level into the a level of input into the situation we're facing. A friend who's a believer can help us see where God is in our situation. And then, of course, prayer. And God honours that prayer. Uh, we see in verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And what does Daniel do? Does he rush quickly to the king and say, King, King, I've solved your problem. Here's your dream. Here's the answer. Now take away the death sentence off all of us. No, he doesn't do that. The very first thing he does is he prays to God and he praises God. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. It's a, a prayer of praise. And the key verse in this prayer of praise is verse 22. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. That's the, that's the key. And this prayer is the heart of this chapter as it reveals to us who God is. And of course, we're going to see it enacted as God does reveal these things and it's something that we know about God as well it is still true God is the one who knows what's going on he's the one who holds history in his hands he knows the purpose of events because he is there in them nothing is dark to God my favorite psalms in the bible is psalm 139 and there's a line in it, verse 12, it says, as, as David, the psalmist, addresses God, he says, darkness is as light to you. And doesn't that give us comfort? Even when God doesn't tell us everything, we know that he is a God who knows. Because just as he has history in his hands, so he has each one of us 
in his hands. He knows our past, our present and our future. He will show us the way to go, even if he only shows us just one step in front of the other. He knows he's in control. He'll be with us and guide us. So it's only once Daniel has praised and thanked God that he goes to the king. In fact, he, he goes to uh, the execution of first, doesn't he? Verse 24, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret the dream for him. So Daniel gets in front of the king and uh, the king asks him, can he interpret it? Does he know the dream? And Daniel says, yes. But notice where he puts the credit. Verse 28, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And I wonder if we're as quick to give God the credit. Because uh, sometimes when we've, we've uh, had an insight or we're able to do something, um, we're very quickly to very quickly assign that to our, our experience or, or our abilities or sometimes even chance. I heard, hear Christians talking about chance and good fortune. It's not good fortune. This is God's hands with you, helping you. So can we give God credit? And it sometimes we, we struggle with that because it, it might sound pious. You know, one of you might say to me, oh, um, I really enjoyed the teaching. Um, and or, or you were really good at that and you know I say well, I, well it wasn't me it was the Holy Spirit and sometimes that sounds a bit weird or, or a bit um, pompous but it's not it's the truth the gifts God gives to us that we're able to share with others we need to give the praise back to God and do you notice uh, just as a just as an aside that verses 27 and 28 contain the two key theological point to these first two sections because he says no wise man enchanter magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he's asked about but there is a god in heaven who reveals mysteries he has shown king nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come so we move on to our next verses verses 31 to 45 the empires that pass and the kingdom that remains. And so Daniel describes this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So there's the dream. And God has given Daniel the interpretation of that dream as well, which we hear. And we'll look a little bit more closely at the nations that that dream refers to when we get to chapter seven. But there are two big things to note. Verse 37. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. So it's in a reminder that in spite of all of his power and his wealth, He's there because God has given it to him. 
His power and dominion come from God. And that is true of the nations today. We might ask the question, why does God allow such and such a, a leader to be there? And some of the answers to those questions, we won't know this side of heaven. But we know that God is sovereign. And of course that it will end. There's no king, however powerful, however much God has given them, that's going to rule forever. Because notice the next words that Daniel says. After that great, that great description, he says, after you, another kingdom will arise. After you. As Nebuchadnezzar was human, he had a lifespan and that was it. Somebody would come after him. And that is true of every leader. It's true of every person, isn't it? It's true of every leader and it's true of every regime. Every single earthly regime, every single earthly ruler will come to an end. Only God is eternal. And Jesus says these words to, to Pilate in John chapter 19, verse 11, you remember. You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. An important truth to remember. And then verse 44, here comes the, the explanation of that final bit of the vision. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. See, because God's kingdom is like no other kingdom. It will not come to an end. It is indestructible, final, overwhelming, supernatural. And it might appear insignificant to begin with against the might of the nations. But it is not. Dale Davis says this in his commentary. The Roman and Christian hating emperor Julian, that's AD 332 to 363, was mortally wounded in a war with the Persians. While Julian's expedition was in progress, one of Julian's followers asked a Christian in Antioch what the carpenter's son was doing. The Christian replied, the maker of the world, whom you call the carpenter's son, is employed in making a coffin for the emperor. Within days, news came to Antioch of Julian's death. And that is where Daniel 2 leaves us. Jesus has a coffin for every empire and emperor. The only true security is in the kingdom of the carpenter's son. And that's the big message of this chapter, isn't it? God is a God who, who reveals things, but ultimately God is a God who has a kingdom. And that kingdom will reign and rule over the earth. And as we trust in Jesus, we can know that we are part of that kingdom. And that information was a, a little veil to Daniel, though we'll see God giving him visions that he can't quite understand and make out at the time because he can't see the true reality of what God is going to do. But he can see that he's going to do it. So we trust in Jesus. We are a part of that kingdom. So our chapter ends with verses 46 to 49. The earthly king praises the true king. Well, Nebuchadnezzar kept his word. Fair play to him. He kept his word from verse 6. He kept the, uh, the leaders alive and he rewarded Daniel. He rewarded Daniel. He gave him this important role in charge of all of the wise men. And his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, well, they're given roles as well, aren't they? Chief ministers out in the province and as we start chapter three tomorrow 
It starts out in the province with those three friends. But it must have been a little uncomfortable for Daniel, don't you think? Because uh, verse 46, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And I love that that's been kept in there um, because that, that kind of goes against uh, what God teaches, doesn't it? It must have made Daniel feel very uncomfortable that he's being praised like a God. We see Paul and Barnabas's reaction in Acts chapter 14 after they healed a lame man and the people there want to put garlands on them and, and put sacrifices to them. And uh, they tried to stop it. Did end up with Paul being stoned. Not clear if there's a direct link to him trying to stop the praise, but um, you know it's uncomfortable, isn't it? But that's the reality of living in a pagan world. People won't always respond in the right way. It seems that Daniel didn't stop him, um, but was glad to see that the king had realised something. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Well, he says the words, but he doesn't really live the life, as we'll see in our next chapter tomorrow. Now, I'm sorry about the technical problems this morning. I know my face is just like a, a white glow after my laptop fell over and I, the light I so carefully sorted out was all messed up. But uh, hopefully you were able to look down at your Bibles and study what we were studying and not be distracted by my glowing white face. Well, it's been good to spend time with you in uh, the book of Daniel. I'm really enjoying the challenge of studying it. I hope you are too. If you want that introduction with all the information about the, uh, the dating and the structure and the various theories about it, then uh, do ask me for it. Uh, a few people already have and it's there ready just to be emailed off to you if you'd like that. Well, let me pray. Our oh, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you that you have your sovereign hands on history. We thank you that you know the past, the present and the future. And we pray that you would help us, like Daniel, to place our trust in you. Whatever's going on in the world around us, whatever we see on our television screens. And help us, like Daniel, when we are put in a difficult situation, to come to you in prayer to talk it through with our Christian friends, to speak with wisdom and grace to those who are causing the, the situation. Help us to listen for your answer to our prayers. And when the answer comes, help us to give the thanks and the praise to you, not just to rush off and uh, deal with the solution that you've given us, but to stop and to give thanks and help us when we exercise our gifts and are praised for them to remember to give the praise where it's due back to you so that others can see how you are at work in your world today. So thank you God that you are the one who reveals mysteries to us. Oh, give us comfort and confidence even when the revelation of the mysteries in our life seems slow. Help us to trust in you, knowing that darkness is as light to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. Thank you for listening and for, for putting up with the technical hitches. Hopefully we'll be better tomorrow and uh, I'll have my new microphone as well, so it should be a little louder. Thanks everyone. Bye.